So you thought about going into case management, but you don't know exactly what they do. I used to be like you. Um, I thought about going into case management to get out of bedside nursing. So I started Googling and going to forums, uh, searching for YouTube videos where people would tell me what they do. Like what exactly do they do? Like their tasks daily when they go to work. A lot of videos, they just talk about a general, you know, like, oh, this is what a case manager is. This is uh, their job, but they don't include details of exactly what they do during the day. So I just transitioned to case management a, a few months ago. Uh, I was a bedside nurse. I was on a Nero stroke PCU unit. I was doing 12 hour shifts, but now after switching to over to case management, it's only eight hours a day, but it's five days a week. And we have to work uh, every, other, every other third weekend. Um, anyways, going to case management, this is my daily routines, okay? First thing in the morning when I get to work at eight o'clock is I go into the case management office. We all have to go in there. We have to get a work cell phone um, and then we get our assignment. So we have we get two packets. One packet, uh, the first page tells me what are my assignments, uh, like what floor I am on, how many patients I get, like room number to room number. Uh, the second packet has a list of doctors and each doctor has uh, like 10 to 20 patients. It varies from day to day. So they're kind of like us, you know, they get an assignment sheet daily. And for case, us case management, most of us get the same assignment, except for the floaters. And you know, just like the floaters, um, nurses on the floor, they, they go from unit to unit, they go wherever they are, they are needed. So they get a, a different assignment almost every day. Um, as for me, I'm, I'm a new case manager, so um, the assignment that I get daily is almost the same. So after I get the two packets, I walk to my floor. Um, I have a little assigned area where I get to sit. It's not really an office. I have to sit on the floor. So we'll have like around 20 patients daily. That's for the weekdays. Uh, that's where we have like 10 to 13 staff. Uh, our hospital usually run around 200 and up uh, for census for the number of total patients. We'll look at the insurance, you know, like to, to see what kind of insurance they have. For example, some patients have Medicare A and B, and then they have a secondary like uh, Community Health Group or Molina. Those are good patients, you know, they have the first, first insurance, second insurance, so they're covered 100%. Uh, some patients have like crappy insurance, you know, or they have no insurance at all. So those are the ones that uh, we have a hard, hard time uh, dealing with because they, they cannot get any services outside the hospital uh, or even uh, equipment from, from outside the hospital like a wheelchair. So after I go over the insurance, you know, I have to eliminate the insurance, uh, like the, um, the insurance that are not in our network where we have to call the insurance company, letting them know, hey, you know, your patient is here. Um, uh, what kind of benefits do they have? and uh, uh, we have to report to them you know because they're the one who who authorize uh, for the patient to stay in the hospital so they're the one who pay the hospital uh, while the patients are, are still in the hospital they want to know what's going on and what what the plan of care is so after I, I eliminate those and you know you have to prioritize those those are the ones that you usually have to do first um, or at the top of your list, you know, not necessary you have to do first, but at the top of your list. Um, and then I go into another section of the, the computer. It's it's called, uh, what do you call that? Um, it's kind of like a task list, you know, if there are any discharges on that task list, it'll tell you. So usually you have to work on those first um, before you work on the consult that the doctors put in. Uh, so the discharge could be uh, home with home health, PTRN, OT, or like uh, home with PTOT, speech therapy, uh, or uh, to a sniff, you know, PTOT or sniff with wound care, IV antibiotics, um, or something like uh, outpatient referrals to vest vestibular, PT, stuff like that, or even equipment, home with home oxygen, 
Um, so when you have a list like that, you have to prioritize which one you want to do first. Usually you want to get the ones that are important. Like for example, if the patient has been in the hospital for 60 days, um, you know, for example, like COVID patients, they, they, they tend to stay in the hospital longer. So you just go down that task list, you know, it'll tell you discharge, it'll tell you the date, uh, which room and all that stuff, uh, and what you need to do uh, sometimes. So you prioritize those, you know, and then the, you do the easy ones first, like the one that go home that don't need anything, you know, where the family can just pick them up. They're um, pretty almost back to their baseline, you know, not necessarily like independent, but, and then you go down with the home health, you know, the list, home health orders, those are easier, you know, you don't have to fill out any forms, you just um, send the referrals and then the agency will respond, uh, depending on the insurance, of course, some insurance, you know, they, they make it hard for you, you know, to process for the patient, like, for example, this insurance, you know what they do, sometimes they, they, um, they make it hard on you. Like, they'll ask you like, oh, why is this patient needing this, you know? Um, I don't think this is necessary. You have to try to explain to them, you know? Or uh, if you try to uh, place them at a skilled nursing facility, and sometimes they will pay the facility lower than Medicare. And so some facilities don't want to take them uh, unless they have a lot of open beds, you know? They, they don't have any choices. They have to fill up their beds. I don't know how low, but I just know it's lower and um, and so you have a harder time sending those patients out discharging them so you kind of like put them at the bottom of the list you know of tasks you know to be done I start doing it from 8 o'clock you know whatever whenever I get onto the floor like 8 15 or something like that um, we have a, a meeting with the charge nurse at 9 15 so they they'll go over stuff like oh this patient uh, uh, the plan is to be discharged or this patient has a sitter, you know, is on restraint, still on two feeding, uh, has a pick line for IV antibiotics, waiting for this procedure, MRI, CT, x-ray, whatever. Um, so, you, so you can get a gist, you know, of what's going on with the patient and plan your day. If they say, oh, this plan, this patient, the plan is um, possible discharge to home or sniff, you know, you kind of put it down. Even though, even though there's no order yet, you can kind of like look at this patient, you know, put them on the bottom of the list, like um, to-do list, you know. So after the charge uh, nurse meeting, uh, that's that usually ends around 9.45 a.m. So um, I was, after that, I just start working on the task list again. Um, at 11.15, we have a, a hospital list meeting. We used to go into a room, you know, a bunch, all the case managers go into a room. Um, the doctors would trickle in one by one, you know, whoever comes first would give us um, um, a, the plan of care for the patients. You know, like I said, you know, we used to go into the room, but now because of the pandemic, we, um, we just call in, we call like, it's kind of like a Zoom meeting, you know, but it's just a telephone meeting. We don't see each other faces. So after the hospital was meeting, usually I, I go to lunch for half an hour. So maybe like around 12 to 12.30, you know. And then when I come back, um, I'll start the list again. Now, if you don't have any more discharges on your task list, then what you go, what you do next is um, you, you go over the consults that the doctors put in. Um, it'll tell you like, oh, consult for uh, homelessness, you know. Usually, well, usually that's what the social worker do, but the doctors tend to put it to case manage. They usually send the task to case managers. I, I don't know why, but and then we have to send the task to the social workers, and yeah, or they'll put in consult like oh um, discharge plan, you know, meaning you have to assess the patient, to uh, talk to the patients uh, or the family to see what they need, what the plan of care is. So that's that's what I want to talk about next. The discharge planning, we call it the DCP, discharge planning. So that's kind of like the API, you know, acute patient intake. You know how when you admit a patient, you ask them a bunch of questions. You know, oh, have you been travel anywhere for for like in the past two weeks or whatever? Uh, have you had this vaccine, pneumo vaccine or or flu vaccine? You know, this season, blah blah blah. So the same thing with the case managers. You know, we do the the initial assessment. Uh, so we'll go in there, we'll ask them like if they're alert and oriented times four, you know, if they're not, then we have to call the family. And uh, depending on if you can reach the family or not, um, and if they speak your language or not. 
uh, we do have the, the the translator, you know, the translator. Anyway, I'm gonna get back to the discharge planning. Uh, so the questions that you ask them is like this, okay? I'll tell you what I remember in my head. Verify the home address. We, we, we print out a face sheet. It has their home address, but emergency contacts, their insurance information, the, the primary care doctor, and other information. You know, it's a face sheet. Um, so I'll ask them, oh, do you still live here? You know, blah, blah, blah. Is it the first level? I mean, is it a one level home, two levels home? If it's two levels, you know, you want to ask them, do they sleep on the bottom or on, at the top? You know, do they have any trouble walking up the stairs? You know, the reason you ask is because they might have a, a PT eval order. You know, we want to make sure that they're able to walk up the stairs and stuff. Ask them, like, who do you live with? You know, do you live alone? Do you live by yourself? Do you have any caregivers? Um, uh, if you do, how many hours a day, how many days a week, you know, we want to see if they able to take care of themselves. If not, are there anybody there who can take care of themselves? And let's say the patient say, oh, I live with my, uh, my, my daughter, you know, and then she's the one who takes care of me at home. And then you find out later, you talk to the daughter, oh, I work five days a week, eight hours a day. And I don't have enough time to care for the patient, you know for those days uh, where the patient have to stay home by themselves. Um, and then I can no longer take care of the patient anymore. I'm like, oh crap, now you have more tasks to do. Now you have to try to find a, a custodial placement, you know, like, or a independent living home or assisted living home or something like that, you know. But then when you do that, you don't have to see if they have any fundings, do you have the insurance? If they don't have a secondary insurance, you know, it's gonna be hard to place, find them custodial placement, you know. And if they don't have any funding like social security or retirement, you know, how if they live at an independent living facility, they have to pay out their own pocket money. They don't have those fundings. Uh, you gonna, no one's gonna, you can't discharge them to home. You can't discharge them to a, a place. They have nowhere to go. So now what do you do? You know? But anyway, so you ask them those questions. Let's see, let's go down to the, the list of questions again, okay? And then you ask them like, oh, before you come to the hospital, you know, were you pretty independent? Are you able to take care of yourself? Um, you wanna know their baseline, you know? And then um, you ask them, who's your primary care doctor? Is this the one, you know, it's, look, it's written on the face sheet. Sometimes they have none. So you, you try to educate them, hey, you need to get a primary care doctor to follow up after discharge, you know? and. Um, uh, we can give uh, we can give them a list of uh, clinics anyway um, and then you ask them for the pharmacy that they usually go to uh, the reason we ask is because the doctors sometimes they they want to fax the prescription over there they they try to um, not write any more paper prescriptions I guess it's easier um, but yeah and then you ask them um, do you use any medical equipment you know like walker, cane, wheelchair, oxygen, CPAP, BiPAP, do they have any shower chair, um, any hospital bed, Hoya lift, or anything like that. Of course, depending on their um, their um, level of activities, you know, and their emulation device and stuff. Some patients, they were like, oh yeah, I use a walker, I have a wheelchair, but I don't use it often. I only use it for like long, long distances or stuff like that. So you ask them about the equipment, uh, do they have any blood sugar, machine supplies, sometimes they run out of supplies, you know. Um, and then the next question I ask them is, are you diabetic? If they say yes, but are you able to uh, check, self-check your blood sugar daily? <clears throat> or does anybody help you? Stuff like that. And then I ask them, um, are you a dialysis patient? Do you go to hemodialysis? If you are, then where do you go? You know, what's your chair time? Is it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? Uh, what time is it? And who, who takes you there? Is it your family? Do you have a transportation company that takes you? Stuff like that. You try to, to uh, arrange it. So if they say yes, you know, I go blah, blah, blah to this place. You have to call the place up to confirm. Like, hey, do you have this patient who goes here? Um, the next question I ask them is, uh, have you ever been to any skilled nursing facility in the past? If they say yes, ask them which one. If they don't remember, that's fine. Um, you can look back in the, the history, you know, you can go back a couple of years if they've been to the hospital, your hospital before, uh, the records there, you can look at it. If not, you know, ask them, do they have any preferences? If they say no, no that's fine. You know, you worry about that later. That's If they need to go to a SNF, then you send the referrals later. Um, and if they are okay with going there if needed, you know, you ask them ahead of time because sometimes they don't want to go to a SNF. 
for rehab or wound care or whatever because they're afraid of COVID right now, you know, because all the stories you heard on, in the news and, you know, you know about it, like all those exposure and then uh, breakout and stuff like that. Um, sometimes the family don't want them to go there. They're like, oh, I can take care of them at home, stuff like that. But it depends on the patient, you know, if they require a lot of assistance, like max assist, and the patient uh, lives with a, like a 60-year-old son or something like that, if the patient's 90 or something, and lives with a 60-year-old son who also has a disability, cannot lift or turn, you know, you're gonna re-educate the family, uh, hey, you know, or the, fa or the patient too, if they're um, alert and oriented. Like, hey, you know, the patient needs a lot, a lot of assistance. You think you can take care of the patient? It's kind of like 24-7 care, you know. You lift, turn, change, feed, uh, stuff like that. You, know, you sure you don't want a patient to go to rehab at the scale of a nursing facility for a few weeks, you know, like short term, um, to hopefully the patient can get better, you know. And sometimes they change their mind. Um, anyway, uh, going back down the list of questions, I'll ask them, you, you ever receive any home health uh, services in the past? If so, which agency? And do you prefer them again or something like that, you know? And usually they're okay with home health services, you know, like a nurse or a, a PT or OT or speech visiting them, you know, taking care of them like two, three times a week for like an hour long each time. Um, <clears throat> uh, for example, like, you know, they have uh, two feeding, you know, the nurse can stop by, check for infection and check to see if they're able to do it like right and stuff like that. Um, or a PT visiting them. You know, sometimes they, they come back to the questions. The next questions I'll ask them are, um, where am I? Home health and then, um, oh, if they were to go home, uh, anybody picking them up? Do they need uh, transportation? You know, if they, they say, oh yeah, my daughter can pick me up. Um, yeah, and if they're in a wheelchair, if they're wheelchair bound, sometimes they're like, oh, you know, my daughter doesn't have a van big enough to pick me up. Um, they, I'm gonna need transportation. That's when you have to set up, you know, like a uh, wheelchair van or gurney or BLS, whatever they they need. You know, depending on their depending on their condition. You know, I don't remember anymore. But anyways, those are some of the questions you ask them for the initial assessment, the API. I mean, the DCP discharge planning. So that's uh, that's like a, your first assessment, you know, and your evaluation evaluation. So once you have that, you kind of know what the plan is. The doctors usually read your, your notes, you know. They want to know what the plan is either. So they'll read your notes and then um, they'll plan accordingly. So yeah, if you have some time, you do that. And then um, that's pretty much your whole my whole day there. The, I just do the task list, the, the DCP. Um, Oh, well, sometimes you have to call the insurance up, you know, to report uh, the plan of care and stuff like that. Uh, and then throughout the day, you know, you might be in, be interacting with the, the nurses, ask them, hey, is this patient, how is this patient, um, you know, is this patient ready to be discharged for today? You know, anything else came up when I was in here at night, you know, stuff like that. Or you talk to um, the social worker to follow up on, you know the homelessness or well i had this one patient like you know he, he came from a psych um a psych sniff a lock unit you know even though he's alert oriented times three to four when you talk to him he sounds he sounds like he can make his own decisions but illegally you know he's not supposed to make his own decisions because he has a psych um issues you know that's why he's in a lock unit so they have a conserv conservator you know so they're the one who can make the the decision like medical treatments and stuff like that because originally this guy he refused to uh, have the pacemaker place you know that's what the nurses told me the charge nurse and the the, um, the primary nurse until later on you know our we have a separate department the ur uh, case management department it's the utilization review case managers so we don't do that we do the transition planning they're the one who review to see if, um Anyway, I don't want to get into UR, but yeah, uh, she, she told me, hey, you know, this patient uh, came from this psych lock unit. Uh, he, he cannot make his own decisions. You know, he cannot refuse the pacemaker. We have to find out who the conservator is. Um, they're the one who can decide the patient needs the pacemaker or not. So that's when we get the social worker involved, you know. Um, she has to find out who it is and stuff like that. And once we, once we have the information, we tell the nurse, we tell the doctor, and then they'll revisit the pacemaker plan, you know. Um, what else do I do? 
All right, so um, I'll give you an example of what I do when there's a task, okay? So let's say uh, there's a task that says, um, discharge to sniff for PTOT. Okay, I'll give you an example of something that goes smoothly. So that's the discharge order, right? So you look at the patient's history and physical, and then um, you check to see uh, if there's a DCP plan that's already done, the discharge plan that's already done, uh, the initial assessment pretty much that was already done by either another case manager or yourself. Um, and then you make sure the patient and the family uh, agree for the patient to go to a, a sniff for PTOT. If they're okay, that's good. Smooth selling, okay? This is for smooth selling. And then you look at the um, doc doctor's progress notes uh, look at the um, PTOT notes uh, to see if they fit the requirement for sniff. Uh, after that, you you fill out a sniff intake form. It's pretty much a form that has patient's information on it, like um, their basic information, name, birthday. Uh, do they have any IVs, wound care? Um, dialysis, uh, insurance, what's their disposition plan, are they going home with family after the rehab. Um, after you fill out the form, you send, it, you send it along with the referral. Pretty much you task your assistant to send the referrals. We use Ansel Care uh, to send the referrals. After you send the referrals, you wait for them to respond on Ansel Care to see if uh, they can take the patient or not. Or sometimes they'll call you straight up, you know, like, hey, we can take the patient, we have a bed open. So I'm like, great, okay, we'll set up a transfer time, uh, get a room number, and then you try to set up transportation, either, you know, a BOS or a gurney or a wheelchair transport. Uh, so you do the same thing, you fill out another form called a PCS form. It's kind of like a form you have to give to the, the transporters when they come, once they come. Like uh, letting the, the transporter know their diagnosis, uh, if they need oxygen, uh, do they need to be monitored while on, on the ride. And then you send the referrals out to the uh, transportation company and wait for them to respond. If, once everything is set up, you know, you tell the nurse, hey, patient's leaving at this time to this facility, blah, 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 and then the nurse will take over from there. So that's smooth, right? Now, I'll give you an example of the same discharge order, but you encounter some problems or oh, delay or require time, more time to take care of it. For example, you know, the patient doesn't have a disposition plan, a good disposition plan. Uh, such as family can no longer take care of the patient. So where is the patient gonna go after rehab? The rehab is a short-term thing. It's for The patient's gonna be there for a few weeks only. And if the patient doesn't have a place to go to and they cannot, they don't have anybody to take care of them where they do require another person to help them, help them at home, the SNF facility will not take the patient because they don't want to deal with it, you know? I mean, only if the patient has like a secondary insurance and if they have funding from like social security or retirement, you know, then the facility might take the patient. But some are really um, picky, you know, they don't want to deal with it. They'll tell you something else like, oh, we, we don't have any beds available or I'm sorry, we cannot help you. Uh, so they just decline it either on Enso care or when you call them up, they will be like, nope, sorry. Another problem you might encounter or it might take up a lot more of your time is, you know, patient first say, oh, uh, I'm okay with going to a sniff. And then later on at the last minute, once everything is set up, they're like, no, I don't want to go there. My family uh, want to take me home. So, okay, that's fine. You cancel it, right? Uh, you set up uh, home health services for them. And then uh, they change their mind again later on. But I know after talking to my other family, I don't know who it is, somebody else in the family, I, I wanna go to a sniff now. I'm like, okay, now you have to cancel the home health services and try to uh, set up the uh, 
reset up the uh, sniff placement. So that's something that you know um, is gonna require a lot more time to handle. So another thing you need to watch out for is uh, okay, the example is gonna be the same. Okay, the discharge order for sniff PTOT. You gotta make sure that uh, you read the PT notes um, to see if the patient qualifies for it. Uh, for example, if the patient already walked for like 300 feet, you know, uh, with supervision or just or actually just independent, the sniff will uh, actually the insurance will not usually will not authorize it, you know. So if the insurance doesn't authorize it, then the sniff uh, facility cannot take the patient. Then you can't send the patient there. And then you gotta make sure that, oh, um, the patient is uh, safe for discharge, you know, like, is the result of the labs okay for today? Um, are the vital signs okay? Um, are they still waiting for another procedure or anything like that? Because sometimes the doctor leaves the discharge order there, but uh, they still have stuff for... Sometimes the doctor leaves the discharge order there, they just never cancel it. So you have to read their notes and follow up with the nurse to see uh, the plan of care for the day. So yeah, that's how my day is. Uh, I don't know what else to add. Maybe I'll make another video if uh, there's like a request or something, you know, like more of a focus uh, theme or something like that. Um, if I found a video in the past of someone talking about case management and kind of telling me the details of what they do throughout the day like this, Oh man, I would have loved it. But I didn't see any, so hopefully this, this will help you guys. Alright. Okay, he's fidgeting a lot, so...